Hi everyone, my name is Alison McQuillan and thank you for joining us for the first panel session discussing from monitoring and calibration to predictive modelling. Um, I'll be hosting this panel discussion with Dr. Will Borden from Mind Design Technologies in the University of Toronto, Dr. Nicola Coley from Hexagon Mining, David de Colombo from Trey Altimira and Neil Barr from Gecko Geotechnics. Over the next 1.5 hours, we'll be talking about the importance of strategically positioned monitoring systems and their reliability, and how the data recorded by these monitoring devices can be utilized within rock science software for stability purposes. Firstly, let me introduce the panelists in more detail before inviting them to put forward their position statements on this subject. Dr. Will Borden received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Engineering Geology. Uh, in 1970 and 1972, and his PhD in rock mechanics in 1980. Following brief periods working in the civil and petroleum fields, his career has been focused on hard rock mining geomechanics with special interest in underground geomechanical mine design. After working for the Noranda Mining Corporation, Dr. Bonder joined academia and is Professor Emeritus in the Mineral Engineering Program and the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Toronto. Along with maintaining a personal consulting practice, Dr. Borden is co-founding partner of Mind Design Technologies, a boutique geotechnical instrumentation manufacturer based in Ontario. Dr. Borden received the Rock Mechanics Award from the Strata Control Committee of the CIM. He is a registered professional engineer in Ontario and British Columbia, a fellow and life member of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum, and a fellow of the Canadian of a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and an Armour Fellow. Dr. Nicolo Coleman holds a degree from the Geology of, from the University of Rennes or the University of Florence, Italy, and a PhD in Geotechnical Engineering and Rock Mechanics from the University of Bologna. He has worked in the fields of rock engineering with several research and professional contracts for various academic and private sectors and published more than 20 papers and international conference proceedings. In 2012, he joined IDS GeoRadar, focusing on the slope monitoring radar application for the mining industry, covering various positions as business developer, regional sales manager, and mining business unit director. In January 2020, he was appointed as vice president mine monitoring for Hexagon Geosystems. In his role, he is responsible for the company's monitoring programs go-to market and business integration for the mining industry. Davide Colombo joined Trey Altimira in 2001, working on satellite SAR inferometry development. Since the beginning, he has been working on integration of data into GIS and third-party software, focusing on the application of remote sense data for surface displacement measurement. He is now working, for the, uh, he is now working to develop the business for INSA monitoring and mining, focusing on the position uh, of robust services over the pits, waste piles, and tailing dams. Most recently, he contributed to CSIR's guidelines for slope deformation and monitoring after the global tailing standard release supported mining companies in applying INSA to manage tailing storage facility risk. And Neil Barr graduated from the University of Queensland in 2008 with his honours degree in civil engineering. He subsequently completed a master's degree majoring in geotech engineering and engineering geology at the University of New South Wales in 2012, and a second master's degree in tunnel engineering in Austria in 2020. Neil has over 15 years of engineering and a related experience on a diversity of mining, tunneling and civil engineering projects across Australia and abroad. He has also held senior engineering and management roles in several mining companies, including Rio Tinto, Octeti, and BHP, and has experience in gold, silver, copper, iron ore, nickel, lead, uh, mineral sands, and diamonds. In 2014, he co-founded Gecko Geotechnics to provide specialist consulting pertaining to rock engineering. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, Dr. St uh, Sorry, Dr. Borden, I'll now hand the microphone over to you for your comments on this subject and introduce your position. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. So I have uh, been a strong advocate for increased and expanded instrumentation in mining since I joined the Miranda Mining Corporation in 1983. In fact, once I joined Miranda, I, I, uh, I started to go around to the various mines. The company had about 17 active mines throughout North America at the time and was the largest natural resource company in North America at the time with uh, both mining, forestry and oil and gas uh, activities. Anyway, I, when I first went out to the sites, I, I rapidly became quite shocked at how, what, how painfully little data we had. And we were doing effectively no monitoring. Uh, of course, there was no, there were no PCs. We had no computers. Uh, the only computers these companies had were, were controlled by the financial group. Technical people never got near them. And uh, so it was quite a challenge. And progress uh, initially was painfully slow. However, it uh, gradually improved and increased as we started to show management that these they need to do, needed to do better and that it would pay off. What I've seen is in the last 10 to 15 years, the so use of instrumentation has increased fairly steadily, but in the last 10 to 15 years, we're actually starting to see what I would call explosive growth in this area, particularly with the large international mine, cave mining operations. I've also, since I uh, got involved in numerical modeling myself, once the PCs became widely available, et cetera, uh, I came to realize the importance of calibration in modeling. And there are two types of calibration. There's qualitative and quantitative. And one could say in some cases, almost a semi-quantitative. Both have their place and should not be demeaned or discounted. It depends on the amount and quality of data you have to put towards the calibration process. Any calibration is better than none. However, it's important to remember that <clears throat> long before the days of computers, of, of, of PCs, we still managed to successfully build and operate large complex mines. Interestingly, in those days, we didn't have computer models, so we built physical, physical models. And you could go to any major mine site and any of the uh, work people who were on uh, light duty, it had some minor injury, and we're just on light duty, uh, they would be assigned to help update that physical model. And in that model, you could take out blocks, you could take out stopes, physical blocks, they were made of wood, and you could try and visualize where boreholes were going to go, uh, where development needed to go, etc. Then once modeling started to become, numerical modeling started to become available, the computers were still not all that high powered. And we were, uh, the best we could do was a linear elastic modeling. And uh, as, as processing power gradually increased, we reached the stage of being able to do routine mine-wide 3D nonlinear, or 3D elastic modeling. Of course, today that has increased to the point where 3D nonlinear mine wide models are quite common. And all these advances in with computing power and, and much better models, et cetera, have, are, are fantastic. I mean, they're, they're, they've given us great improvements and great value. But as I noted in, uh, in my earlier talk today, uh, there are also some problems and, and many people now, in my opinion, have fallen into the trap of thinking that only complex nonlinear models have any value. And many ignore the fact that the underlying inputs for most of these analyses can be of quite low quality and may not be available at all. 
one needs to be very cognizant of these kind of issues in before you even think about using such a model. And certainly as you're looking at how to interpret the data from the output. So one of the big problems we have as well, the latest nonlinear numerical model capabilities are absolutely amazing, as I mentioned, our ability to acquire appropriate input parameters and use calibration tools have not kept pace. And, and that's where the root of, of the problem lies. So that summarizes my position paper for this, and uh, I'll pass this on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Borden. Dr. Kola, I'll hand over to you, please. So thank you, Alison. And uh, as you said, uh, I mean, in these uh, almost 10 years with uh, the SGO Radar Hexagon system, I've gained a fair extensive experience regarding slope monitoring with specific focus on radar technology. And uh, I've had the pleasure to, uh, and the opportunity to try and combine this experience with my geotechnical background, uh, trying to push me outside of the boundaries of pure monitoring and try to add the value to the industry. Uh, we know that the use of slope monitoring radar is uh, now a standard practice in open pit mines, and radars uh, can uh, are used for safety critical slope monitoring, mainly to provide alerts in the event of progressive uh, movements that could potentially lead to a slow failure. Uh, but also, it's important to uh, remark that uh, due to the radar's capability to collect quantitative information regarding the slow behavior in both space and time, it's possible to use the data, the, uh, uh, the amount of data that uh, is collected by radars in support of slow stability modeling. So the possibility to relate each uh, pixel of the radar displacement map to the geographical coordinates, together with the capability of uh, uh, radar, modern radars to handle long-term data sets, we are talking about of months or even years of data in a single uh, project, make it possible to integrate the radar data into a wi wide variety of uh, uh, geoengineering and geotechnical analysis. So at the same time, we know that today uh, current uh, 3D slope modeling software allows the direct uh, importation of a variety of formats, 3D wireframes representing survey, topography, but also the deformation uh, recorded by radars, uh, ground-based radars, as well as uh, satellite radars. So this uh, interpolability between modeling software and monitoring data provides uh, geotechnical engineers an, a, a unique opportunity to back analyze material properties and refine slope stability models for pit optimization. I remember approximately two years ago during an international uh, rock mechanics conference, I sat down with uh, Thamer and, uh, and Neil and we discussed the basic assumptions of radar and numerical models integration. So despite we all agreed on the intrinsic value that this would add in terms of model calibration and uh, so as a consequence, as a better understanding of the rock mass behavior and ultimately an increased safety for mine operation operators, uh, we also convened that although the tools were there, we, we had all the tools available, but uh, little efforts had been made uh, at the time among technology providers to streamline this process and provide an easy to implement workflow for uh, geotechnical prediction, predictioners. So at that time we came up with this concept of uh, modeling uh, of a monitoring to modeling loop, where by basically enabling a seamless workflow among uh, the applications, uh, practitioners could easily move between radar data to numerical modeling for a better and precise model calibration. Also, very soon, in the next couple of months, we will 
close the loop by adding the possibility to import the um, uh, numerical model safety maps back into the radar software for a complete risk assessment workflow. So uh, uh, many technology providers have then followed and made their data sets available for numerical model integration. And the value of the MTM method and workflow has been demonstrated with uh, several case studies and presentations that have been made in uh, international rock mechanics conferences and papers. The example above represents a radar to model calibration implementation that was done to characterize the slope stability in, a, in an open pit mine in, uh, in PNG. A good correlation was found between low uh, factor of safety areas in predictive models and areas where the actual movement was detected during and after the excavation by the slope monitoring radar. As a direct result, significant improvements were made in relation to geotechnical hazard management by utilizing models to better understand the failure mechanism. So as a summary, we can say that uh, the enhanced understanding of instability conditions, of course, allow the adequacy of the monitoring system to be reviewed, alerts and alarms to be based on updated hazard thresholds, and possible improvements to the mine plan to be suggested. The amalgamation and the interpolability between numerical models and the interferometric radars data has both predictive models and live monitoring data together, offering an additional mean of reconciling design and actual slope performance, which can uh, help achieve significant improvements to the overall geotechnical hazard management by helping engineers better understand the failure mechanism when potential instabilities are identified by the readers. I, I, I also want to add that the more advanced applications, that this is just the beginning, because more advanced applications could be in the future uh, developed to help better predict the most likely failure mechanism, uh, and also maybe extend the same concept of uh, radar to monitoring calibration to other applications like uh, uh, rockfall predictive models. So next slide, it's uh, my conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Coley. Uh, Davida, your thoughts on this subject? At first, uh, thank you for having me in the panel. It's an honor to be here with you guys. As mentioned, I've been working for, with INSAR for almost 20 years now. I started working with INSAR in 1999 at the university. Then we came along with uh, a, a, as a spin-off. Uh, and I've seen the evolution of the technology from a purely academic uh, uh, technology, looking at uh, uh, the earthquakes, uh, uh, natural landslides, and now approaching uh, uh, and being applied by geotechnical engineers, uh, uh, specifically in the mining sector and more recently on, on, on embankments and dams. I'm not a geotechnical engineer, declare myself uh, here, but I've been working with a lot of geotechnical engineers uh, uh, in the last years, and I uh, tried to understand uh, their requirements. Uh, essentially, I understood that uh, they think in a basic, uh, uh, simple cycle when they design, apply, and execute uh, their mine, and in the same way they approach the the, the monitoring. While numerical modeling is playing a, a key role in most of the stages of this of these, uh, of these process, uh, um, we are discovering all together that monitoring is a key part uh, to control, to check that uh, the, the, the plan was right. And basically the effect of the plan is under control. While uh, many technologies like geotechnical instruments and radars have been applied uh, mainly in the pits uh, to prevent failures, or at least understand that a failure was coming and mitigate the issues or basically get ready for this to happen. Most recently, we are experiencing, we are seeing that uh, uh, what's happening in the business is that most of the issues that are creating a problem are connected not, not anymore with the pits, uh, thanks to all the monitoring that is up there, but with, uh, with other assets like the tailing dams or embankments. So, um, 
in that sense, uh, the, the mining community is looking at uh, uh, the proper way to monitor the tailings and to monitor those structures that are by design supposed to be stable. And uh, eventually, uh, sometimes they are not. Ideally, uh, I mean, in, 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 in an ideal world, uh, uh, there should be in place some kind of cycle where you create your model with your safety factor, I mean, with all the coefficients that are permeating the, the, the structure when you build it, uh, but then uh, you should be monitoring all the, the parameters of the structure that you built, uh, uh, because essentially the environment around it is changing. So basically not only the global warming, but many things can change all around the place. The operator can change, the way the structure is operated can change in time. So, so, so monitoring the structure is, uh, is essential and is essential uh, at the same time to make uh, the model become a living thing in order for it to change according to the changes that the structure is experiencing in time. In that sense, uh, the cooperation between whatever monitoring instruments and software like uh, rock sciences are, are crucial because now you are connecting uh, you know, the beginning, the model of it uh, with uh, the effect that you can measure on the structure that you design, you built, and you are now and you are now using in uh, real time. What I found uh, working with uh, with people like you is that most of the time there is an issue with this kind of discussion that is basically connected with budgets. Of course, everybody is living in the real world, so basically um, everybody is trying to optimize the monitoring strategy with respect to the budget that is available. Now, uh, most, re most recently, is, is becoming a part of this discussion, and uh, we've seen uh, um, that uh, uh, it's not infrequent that the application of INSAR as a sort of uh, uh, tool to understand where are the areas of concern, so uh, to um, use the, this kind of maps as an opportunistic tool to detect the issues all over the place is basically generating more awareness of the issues that are around and um, leaving in the, in the hands of the geotechnical engineer a, an important set of information to determine which are the best tools to install on, on the ground. Um, again, integration is crucial. Uh, monitoring without uh, uh, any kind of consideration on uh, the actions that should be triggered uh, can be flawless. So uh, in that sense, uh, all kind of integration is, uh, is welcome. And uh, uh, again, uh, when it's possible to this numerically, not just in a qualitative way, but confronting numbers, integrating instruments and uh, validating the models, uh, it's just uh, the best way to do it. A few words specifically on, on INSAR, because as I mentioned, uh, we uh, are applying now a technology in, in, as, a, as a monitoring tool, but uh, it's been seen um, until a few years ago as a quite an academic uh, thing. Uh, we were, I mean, we, we, we were used to deliver, uh, for example, every three months. Nowadays, we deliver mm, on a, on a weekly basis when, when needed. So the service is evolving, uh, is evolving with uh, the satellites that are, uh, that are in the orbit now and what is coming along in the future. For sure, many of you guys have been uh, using, uh, have been uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, uh, the Sentinel constellation that is providing free data to everybody. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, cheap solution in terms of uh, first approach to, to INSAR. Uh, most recently, we have seen a lot of investment from many, many companies in, in Europe uh, and in the US to invest in new satellites. So the promise they give us uh, is that in a few years, uh, maybe just in two years, one year, we can have new constellations that will, uh, be, will make us uh, uh, in, in a position to, to deliver 
millimeters of displacement on the ground on a daily basis. And I believe this is my last. So again, uh, thank you very much for having me in the, in the conference and I look forward for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Davide. And Neil, from your experience, your comments, please. Thanks, Alison. Um, in general, I believe that mostly all models are wrong, but many are useful. So my general position is that we need to continuously improve our models with monitoring data. So basically we have limitations in our understanding of ground conditions, and this remains a major area of uncertainty in geotechnical engineering projects, whether they're tunnels, caverns, road or railway slopes, or surface or underground excavations. And despite excellent improvements in ground characterization techniques over the last decades, including spatially extensive and deep geophysical surveys, borehole investigation techniques, and new technologies for reviewing drill core samples, Geotechnical engineers are still typically faced with significant gaps in data av availability. Quite simply, it's almost impossible to fully characterize the ground down to each specific joint set that's available. Um, and in many cases, it's very difficult to have the appropriate level of confidence with respect to the size of the proposed excavations in a cost-effective manner. So as a result of this, we often make very large extrapolations on ground behavior through simplifications in ground characteristics. Now this is typically in a couple of ways. One is by grouping available data into zones of expected similar behavior based on statistically familiar features. Another limitation is how we choose to actually model the situation in a numerical simulation and the level of detail we put into that model. Uncertainty is also another aspect that's really poorly understood by many geotechnical engineers, but especially by project managers and senior executives who are there to approve the projects before execution and make adjustments during execution. So in general, similar, simpler models um, with less input parameters, generally easier to calibrate. In the late 2010s and even more so in the early 2020s, computer capability, as, as Dr. Borden already said, is certainly there, we can do numerical simulations and the software is becoming ever more user friendly. So it's enabling practitioners to routinely use numerical modeling techniques in both 2D and 3D for most geotechnical engineering applications. And this is where calibration becomes very critical to make sure that we get something a bit more sensible. And there's various ways we can do calibration from qualitative or basic sense checks where we're spatially correlating areas of low factor of safety versus areas of increased deformation, using deformation monitoring to identify potential geological features that we previously didn't understand from the ground investigations, back analyzing failures to confirm and or update failure mechanisms based on monitoring data, and to the higher end of doing quantitative calibration or detailed numerical calibration based on matching multiple areas in terms of stress measurements and deformations over several phases of investigations. Now, notwithstanding that, model calibration is not the only solution. It needs to be applied in conjunction with other techniques, including bridging the gaps in the ground characterization. And even doing that and model calibration, I still don't believe it will fully eliminate the potential for unexpected ground behavior. But if we use this process as a continuous improvement process, we could eventually get to the stage towards right at the end of the project execution phase where our model could actually be almost right. Thanks, uh, that's my perspective, cheers. Thanks, Neil, and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, we also have Dr. Reginald Hammer, Director of Rock Science Africa online. Um, so I now invite everyone to turn back on their cameras, please, and we'll debate this topic. And I also invite uh, questions from the audience if you'd like to type them into the chat box in the Attendify uh, window. We'll get to those as we progress the discussion. Uh, I just want to kick off with the first question, and please, it's open to everyone for, for comment. Um, but both Neil and Davida, you both comment that it's important to identify the parameters which must be monitored to ensure that the relevant inputs are used to update models. And Neil, um, your recent comments were, it's near impossible to fully characterize ground conditions with appropriate level of confidence in a cost-effective manner. 
Um, to the panelists, what do you see as the critical information or investigation program to adequately characterize ground conditions um, and calibrate models for an operating mine? Um, noting that some of your observations are that the amount of subsurface instrumentation appears to have reduced in recent years in favor of surface monitoring. monitoring. So while yes, surface monitoring adds a lot of value, for us to truly um, understand the failure mechanism, um, we, we also need subsurface monitoring. And Will, maybe your background, if you'd like to start here. Sure, thank you. Well, the, uh, saying that subsurface monitoring has, has decreased, that depends on uh, which operations you're speaking of. So, you know, one, one of the large cave, a couple of the large caving operations have over 2,000 of our, uh, of my company's excessometers installed in their uh, production, on their production levels. So that is it, that's unprecedented really in terms of the number of, of, uh, of instruments. The problem is getting all that data to surface and managing it. Now, until the recent development of wireless underground communications, that, that was just not at all possible. But today it is. That data can be transmitted to surface in near real time and, and be put on a uh, whatever computer you want and, and can use whatever software you want to, uh, to, to deal with all of that. So that, that, that's a big step forward, but not many companies are doing that. That's pretty specialized. Uh, and, and, and these large caving operations have very specific needs, especially on their production level. Uh, more quote unquote ordinary mines certainly do not have that level of instrumentation. Although I would say for the larger ones, the amount of instrumentation has, that I see going in underground has actually been steadily increasing. We always, of course, we still have operations that won't install any instruments <laughs> or very few, and that's never going to change. They're the small operators who, who have pretty limited resources. But I do see the level of instrumentation increasing. And I think that's being that's tied directly to the fact that they can now get the data on surface in real time, which it makes a complete game, a game changer because now we, we can tie that to alerts, for instance, if, if, because a lot of times this is a really a major safety concern. So if we can tie the instrumentation to alerts that, that can uh, email the geotechnical engineer when there's a certain threshold is crossed, that's a, that's a big improvement. But the other thing it can do, where the gap is now, is tying that data into the numerical model in a, in a realistic and time effective way to really make the optimum use of that data. And that's, I think, where there's a significant need for additional research. I'll stop my comments there. Thanks, Will. Um, anyone else, Neil, Niccolo, Davida, you'd like to comment? Yes, um, th thanks, Will, for the underground perspective. From the open pit side, um, there certainly has been a trend um, in most operations to move away from inclinometers, um, prism monitoring, and definitely go to radar and INSA um, for multiple reasons. Uh, it's easier, uh, less people walking on berms and benches potentially exposed to rockfall risks and, and those things. Uh, we've certainly seen that where we have had failures in, in multiple mines, um, coming back to back analyze them with surface data only has been a lot more challenging than it has in the past where, where you've had a multitude of inclinometers to identify where your shearing is actually occurring underground. Um, so we need to find, in my view, the right balance of surface and subsurface monitoring to, to help us do that. Um, equally with um, inclinometers and, and subsurface gear, as you said, um, all, the, all the telemetry systems on, in open pit mines are out there. Um, can have in place inclinometers, shape accelerates, you can have real time data down the hole as well as on surface. So, tools like Canary and uh, Navstar and other integration platforms also help you put, bring all that together um, and alongside your port pressure monitoring. So, it is, it is certainly improving, and the next uh, 10 years are, are looking very exciting. 
Thanks, Neil. David, you also commented um, in your opening uh, speech. Anything from you? Um, yeah, I just uh, I'm following the same 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 approach. So saying that uh, we've seen a lot in the recent years that uh, um, using uh, uh, some remote sensing like like Insar or or also a few images, uh, it was possible to understand that was an, an area of concern that was not known. So now it's a uh, it's a way you know to optimize everything in a holistic way, saying okay now. You know better that you have an area where you have a concern. Of course, you don't know the source of the concern. You stay on the surface and you have just maybe some surface sleep, something like that. And then you go investigate and then you can put your instrumentation, you can put a piezometer. It's not unfrequent that you put a radar in front of the wall that you've seen uh, that was moving. So uh, again, the, the capacity of having all these uh, remote sensing um, maps uh, that do not require you to get there and give you information frequently about things that are happening on the surface. They, they, they typically spur uh, discussions about what's going on underneath and then new instrumentation will come in a, in a, in a, in a, say in, 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 a, in a better way, in, in a more uh, 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 realistic approach uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the implementation of the monitor. Thanks, Davide. Nicola. Question for yeah. you, um, if I can elaborate on that, but monitoring helps us to identify an area of concern. I'm sure you get this question all the time, maybe a slightly loaded question, uh, but one that's asked frequently. Uh, what thresholds should people threat, uh, set um, to identify these areas of concern and answer that um, in any way that you'd like to, just to promote yeah. some discussion? On this typically yeah, asked you are right. This is a very common question, and uh, the answer is that there's not a, there's not a single answer to that question because uh, it really depends on many factors, both on the uh, technological side and on the geological side. I mean, uh, thresholds to identify, uh, you know, like uh, conditions at risk, are really dependent uh, from a technological from a technological point of view on the uh, and I'm speaking about uh, radars, but uh, that, that's true also for uh, uh, other uh, monitoring uh, technologies like uh, total stations and so on. They have many types of uh, uh, different influence like line of sight, uh, scan speed, uh, resolution, and uh, uh, that can affect the way that you set your thresholds. And definitely they have to be uh, evaluated case by case. So there's not an universal rule that you can apply in uh, for all conditions. And on the other side, uh, of course, uh, and maybe even more important, uh, the geological condition of the slope, uh, the, of course they play uh, a critical role because uh, depending on the type of uh, uh, instability that for example, you need to uh, pick up. Uh, if it's a brittle failure, so you have a very, uh, short uh, uh, early warning uh, time or if it's a ductile type of failure so you have more time to react uh, that makes a lot of difference and ultimately I would say also the level of risk that you are uh, uh, that you are uh, ready to take I mean how far right you want to go before having this uh, alarm and that's and that's mainly you know um, a decision that ultimately uh, lies with the uh, with the uh, geotechnical experts and to the uh, operation so how far you want to go and uh, how far you can go also with respect as i said to the uh, rock mass condition and uh, the specific tarps for the for the site before you can trigger an alarm so the ultimate question as i said there's not a universal rule that needs to be evaluated case by case uh, there are experts that can uh, provide uh, guidance and uh, and support this decision, but uh, it needs to be evaluated on the entire uh, technical and geotechnical context. Thank you. And even on a site level, there cannot be a one size fits all approach, can there? Um, anyone else like to comment on this question or statement? I guess I might uh, add a comment. Uh, from the underground perspective, particularly, 
uh, what we normally look for when we're uh, interpreting extensometer data, we're not, we don't get too excited because things are moving as long as they're moving in a linear fashion. But when they start to accelerate, we get very, very nervous. And so that's why we, for instance, uh, restrict access immediately after the blast in, the, in a given area. And, and uh, the, I mean, you have to do that because of uh, noxious gas reasons. So you have to clear the area of for ventilation. But also, you want to make sure, and, and the other thing you have to worry about is seismicity. So you often get a rapid increase in seismicity with the blast. So there are many reasons we keep the crews back from re-entering until we have, uh, we have uh, passed a certain number of tests. And the seismic system gives you one, but extensometers also do, because they will accelerate immediately following the blast. And you watch them because what you expect is that they will then decelerate and restabilize. But if they don't, <laughs> Nobody's going back in. Thanks, Will. In, in leading on from that statement as well, um, at what frequency do you believe that um, the monitoring information that's acquired on a basically a minute, hourly, even daily basis should be fed back into these geotechnical models that often take weeks to build or days within rock science? Um, hours or days, but sometimes if the complex models, it can be weeks. So what frequency um, would you recommend uh, feeding that information back into models? I might have a go at this one from a, from a surface mining side. Um, it depends really on, on your mine plans um, and how you're using your 3D stability models. So for example, if you're doing quarterly plans and updates to the schedule, you could potentially do a quarterly update um, to, to all your mine designs um, with, with rock science software in a matter of weeks, say two weeks. So, you know, the monitoring frequency you really need is sort of daily um, or, or even weekly to feed back in. Um, but the more data you have, the more confidence you have. Um, and you also have to be careful that you don't have too much data that you get uh, bogged down in the detail. I think from a surface mining side and, and continuously updating mine plans, you could probably uh, use daily to, to weekly data. Davide or Nicolo, do you have a comment um, from your sides? Yeah, I guess, you know, from a modeling standpoint, Neil has definitely more experience. I can say that uh, it's probably also depending on uh, what you need to model in terms of uh, uh, like in a time behavior. I would say, of course, uh, if you have to take into account uh, a time span uh, of, uh, for example, slope design uh, uh, of five years or so on, then you need a long data set for sure. So within the same project, uh, you cannot just base the model calibration on one day uh, let's say um, monitoring uh, uh, data set. So it's also, I guess, depending on uh, the, um, the final purpose of the, what you want to model and how far you want to extend the, the model result in, in, uh, in, in time. Thanks, Davida, would you like to come in? Yeah, I mean, I agree with all that was said. Uh, um... Again, it, it depends on, on the local condition. It depends on what's going on. For example, uh, sometimes I, I, I see very different attitudes from a mine that is in the middle of the desert uh, without rainfalls or a mine that is uh, in, in Africa in the, in the rainy season. Of course, their sensitivity to risks uh, and they, the, 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 the possibility to incur in a, in a problem is very different and it's possible that the reasoning around the update of the model might be very driven by these kind of factors that are all not dependent uh, on mining itself, uh, that are all external factors that might uh, have an important role in this kind of, of, of decisions. It's more outside of the, of the technological environment where I live in, but uh, working with these technical engineers, I, I see these uh, 
has a huge impact in their way of taking decisions. Thank you. And speaking of external factors, many of the instrumentation now have um, corrections, uh, typically atmospheric correction algorithms that are applied to the data. Um, your comments on ensuring that um, the correct corrections are made and also any corrections on defamation data that's recorded and how reliable the data is if there's, um, if there's uh, geofabrics or mesh on top of the slope as well. What's actually being measured um, in, in those cases when there's some support elements on the face for then use in model calibration? How reliable is that movement that's detected there, um, especially in changing weather conditions? So maybe I can uh, start with this. So how reliable? I guess uh, in any case, uh, you know, with the atmospheric correction, we are trying to model uh, a real phenomena that is uh, unlimitedly complex. So uh, for sure, uh, in the re especially in the recent years, uh, the, there are many advances that uh, have been made in terms of atmospheric, automatic atmospheric correction for real-time uh, monitoring data. And uh, I would say they are pretty reliable. Uh, of course, again, they are still uh, depending on many external factors, including, but not limited just to atmosphere, but uh, also to the line of sight, as I said. Uh, and uh, so uh, I guess, you know, it's not, uh, again, uh, possible to uh, uni uniquely quantify the reliability in all uh, and uh, every situation. But I would say that we have made, uh, as technology provider, uh, lots of advancements to make sure that uh, in most of the cases, the data provided by the monitoring instruments represent uh, as best as possible the, uh, you know, the real behavior of the slope of the slope. Uh, of the slope. Um, so yeah, I guess this is, uh, this is my point. Thanks. Nicolo Davide? Well, um, I would say that um, it's, 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 it's difficult to give a, a proper answer in a sense that when uh, you're monitoring uh, a surface, uh, maybe in, in Central Africa uh, from a satellite and you have no idea, you never have your feet down there, it's uh, it's difficult to, to 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 comment on these kind of things, uh, but uh, from a technological point of view, uh, the technologies around uh, since twenty years have improved uh, their uh, the, the the usability of the numbers that it provides. So it's not uh, science fiction that you can see these millimeters from 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 the sky. Of course, uh, like every te technology, uh, there are limitations. So if you have uh, uh, 25 meters of displacement in two days and you're acquiring every 11 days, you will not be able to measure it. I mean, it's, it's basically intrinsic with uh, the limitation of each technology. I believe uh, it's, it's a process of becoming accustomed with uh, the technologies, uh, the methods to, to analyze, uh, and uh, the confidence is using the data. At the end of the day, thermometer can be wrong uh, one degree, but when you measure your temperature, you're fine with it, uh, simply because you accept the fact that the instrument that you're using might be a bit wrong. Um, in, it seems that sometimes uh, we are losing ourselves in, into details uh, and we don't consider the bigger picture as the, uh, the, the, the information that we can get. There was a comment from, from, from Neil about that uh, before. Sometimes it's, uh, it's important to get uh, uh, the, the, the bigger picture from the data and not lose yourself uh, into the small details that will defocus your attention from what, what is relevant. Yeah, and uh, maybe if I can add uh, to this, uh, I would say uh, it's also important to understand that uh, in any case, uh, we are using tools that uh, for as much as they can be uh, reliable and advanced, but they still require uh, a human, uh, let's say, interpretation. And that's, uh, that's very important. And that's said by technological, technology providers. 
uh, the, the human interpretation is still a, a very, I would say, a fundamental factor in everything that has to do with, uh, with monitoring because of the reasons that we have just discussed. So as uh, technology providers, we are striving to uh, improve the, the solution and to make them uh, uh, more accurate and reliable. And as I said, uh, there are incredible uh, progresses that uh, were made uh, in the last uh, couple of years. But we still need to remember that, uh, uh, you know, having a holistic uh, view, uh, cross colorating different sources of information and uh, having, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say an informed uh, informed understanding of what's going on also from a geotechnical geological point of view is absolutely uh, of paramount importance i just wanted to reply to the, your second part of the question Alison, regarding the uh, tissues ge geo tissues and and mesh well, uh, of course, uh, I mean, it depends uh, on the type of technology, but uh, speaking about radars, uh, if you have uh, something that, uh, you know, in between the slope uh, and, uh, uh, and the radar, then definitely, especially if you have a reflective, uh, very reflective surface, for example, a, a wired drape mesh, uh, metallic mesh, then uh, uh, you have the radar waves that are reflected by the mesh. And uh, we can see, for example, a season a daily variation. Uh, we have some uh, experience and some cases where we see the daily variation of the expansion of the mesh with a day and night cycle, for example. Uh, this, but this doesn't mean that uh, if you have a movement behind the mesh, that is of a, of a magnitude, of an order of magnitude uh, uh, greater, higher than this uh, daily cycle, you will still pick it up because uh, it will move the mesh more than what the, the daily cycle is. So I guess, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's still something that is in between the, the measuring tool and the measured surface, so it can have an interference. And again, it's a matter of understanding what this interference and the behavior could be. Thanks, Nicolo. Um, we talk about measurements, so it's often absolute measurements that are included in TARPs uh, for elevating conditions from normal to, to higher um, as we go through the traffic light system. Um, how do you guys see, uh, Will, you alluded to before, you're looking actually at trends, you're not just looking at absolute values of movement. Um, how do you as a panel see incorporating these trends from monitoring instrumentation such as VWPs um, versus radar monitoring data so that uh, a better understanding can be gained in our TARPs of what the slope's actually doing? Do you believe that absolute values should be included or some other type of relative value? Um, should be included in TARPs. Neil, you're keen. <laughs> it's a difficult question. There's a lot of answers to this one. Um, I think the industry has gone to a lot of absolute values, um, possibly a percentage change um, type of value could be more efficient. Um, but nothing takes um, takes the need away, as, as Nicola said, from, from the human factor. Um, people need to look at the data, um, look at data from various data sources, correlate them, understand the behavior and make an informed decision based on that. Um, and I think more, more importantly than having very robust and detailed TARPs, we need very well trained, educated and skilled people. Um, and that includes the new tech, newer technologies like radar and INSA. Um, but it doesn't take away from the older, um, more crude technologies like simple crack meters. Um, for example, I've got a couple of engineers with four or five years experience that have never installed a crack meter. Um, they don't actually know what one looks like. So like, we need to find, again, we need to find some sort of balance between the latest technologies, which are absolutely fantastic, and having that old school, I guess, um, second layer of understanding um, where people actually go in the field check the ground conditions and also monitor. Um, and that could also be incorporated in some sort of TARP, but it needs to be more interactive with the, the human interface with the human user. Any other comments from the panel on this topic? 
I'd like to just uh, <clears throat> expand a little bit about on what Neil said, I guess, particularly from the underground perspective. Uh, one of the great monitoring tools we have underground that is often terribly underused is simple damage mapping in the drifts. And, and that provides a mine wide tool that can be updated on, on some routine basis and, and definitely helps in uh, qualitative uh, model calibration. And so it's, it's simple. Neil talked about a simple crack meter. I couldn't agree more. And uh, the damage mapping is effectively uh, a large scale crack meter, if you wish. And uh, so there's things like that. And, and, and the aspect of getting boots on the ground and observing the behavior of the rock map is absolutely essential. All the instrumentation in the world will not solve your problems if you do not go out and look at the bloody rock. Thanks, Will. Um, can we talk a little bit about rock fall for a moment? Nicolo, you alluded to in your position um, paper that the technology is coming to um, better predict rock fall analysis. How do you see this from your perspective and what I guess Hexagon has available and what's in product development, but assisting geotechnical engineers um, to, to better predict rockfall and calibrate rockfall models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically I think uh, we can summarize with the fact that uh, up until uh, now, basically, we've had uh, tools and devices uh, to measure the onset of potential failures, so the early warning. We, we have um, tools to measure the uh, post failure, like uh, slope mapping to identify areas of uh, detachment and areas of accumulation. But uh, we, we had a, a gap in between. So the, the big question with the uh, rock falls, uh, so they're characterized by very sudden occurrence and very rapid development is uh, what happens during the rock for itself, which is something that uh, up until now, basically, uh, it was almost, I would say, impossible to, to measure. So recent uh, advancements in, uh, in radar technology today uh, made possible to develop specific system uh, that uh, with the purpose of measuring and tracking uh, these kind of events, and uh, and um, log all the uh, tracks and uh, and the ev single events. So basically, we have now uh, a map of what happens during the event. And uh, by logging all this information, then uh, a, a real you know comparison, like we are doing now with the uh, displacement maps and uh, and uh, uh, slope stability analysis models. The same in the, in the future could be done uh, between, uh, um, let's say, uh, rockfall data from uh, monitoring rockfall data from the radar and uh, specific uh, rockfall simulation software. Thanks, Nicola. Neil, I'm sure you have a comment on this. No, it's, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, being able to see and monitor all rockfalls that occur. Um, on a slope will be excellent. Um, we're currently probably limited um, to what we visually see and identify during field inspections or identified by deformation based radars um, as an after event, um, after the fact event, but it has to be of a significant enough size to be detected. So whenever we're designing against rockfall um, in a risk-based or a quantitative risk-based approach, um, our information is probably skewed to the larger magnitude events, um, ignoring the lower magnitude events. So we're potentially over designing in many cases. Um, certainly this technology will help us have a better understanding. Um, and in a lot of mines, we're not allowed to do rock wall testing ourselves. So for example, even kicking rocks off benches, we're not allowed to do that because of a potential safety risk, um, let alone doing larger scale rock fall tests to calibrate numerical models. So this technology will certainly, uh, in my view, help um, with that process. Thanks, Neil. So we're obviously gonna have a lot more information going forward as we've got more monitoring data and feeding this back into numerical model models. Um, there's obviously, 
uh, your comments on the number of iterations or sensitivity analyses that should be completed um, to obviously there's not just one solution there's a lot of uncertainty still in the model and Will you talked about you know just using relatively simple um, but very useful elastic models instead of diving straight into complex uh, non-linear models your comments there from the panel Neil do you want to start with your on screen Sure. I think, look, we're going to always have more and more data, but we're going to get better and better at managing it and filtering it. Um, I've no doubt we're going to need more industry professionals to help deal with all of that. Um, but in many cases, we will have to simplify it. And there could be a potential solution in simplifying, for example, a Rockfall model to, base, to be based completely on observational data. Um, once that data is available um, and only use numerical applications when they're specifically needed. Um, Thanks, Neil. Will? Well, again, I think uh, when, when we talk about uh, which, which model to use and what level of complexity, it's got to be matched to the problem. It has to be matched to the problem and it has to be matched to the available data. So if you were, are, let's face it, in, in, in the geotechnical world, we're pretty much always data limited, particularly underground, very data limited. And that's not going to change. I mean, there's just, a, you can't drill enough holes to change that. Uh, so you have to look carefully at, at the quantity and quality of data that you have and, and your ability to parameterize that to, a, to the model you want to use. So an elastic model is pretty easy. There's only, basically there's only two parameters or at worst five, but as soon as we, get much more complex than that. Uh, there's a lot of parameters and therefore there's a lot of judgment calls in terms of judging those, uh, assessing those parameters and assessing the variability in the parameters and then fig figuring out how you're going to incorporate all of that into the numerical model. And, and at some level, it almost appears that it becomes self-defeating that there's too much uncertainty to get past it. So at that point, you need to pull back, I think, and maybe just settle for a simpler model that you have more, a better chance to get a, some kind of reasonable calibration on. Your thoughts then on AI and machine learning? Obviously, in the last what, five years, it's that terminology has boomed within um, the mining industry for uh, you know, mechanical issues as well in trucks, but as that may filter into geotech engineering, with this uncertainty, um, will the introduction of AI and machine learning in numerical models, will it be helpful or will it be a hindrance? I'm, I'm no expert in uh, AI, that's for sure. That's the last thing I claim. But from my limited knowledge and what I, I've, read a little bit about, I would think it should be potentially a great help, but uh, we're nowhere near that yet. Although maybe perhaps I'm just so unknowledgeable in this area that I don't know where we are. No, not at all. Um, but Nicolo and Davida, your comments there? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely AI and machine learning is definitely something, uh, you know, that uh, is part of the future. So uh, sooner or later, uh, there will have to be uh, some progress on that direction. And, uh, you know, I agree, there will not be the holy grail to solve uh, the, the all the problems of, uh, not, not problems, but uh, all the aspects of, uh, uh, you know, uh, related to also the monitoring data and monitoring uh, uh, equipment but i'm sure they will definitely help especially in the interpretation of difficult conditions thanks nicola davida yeah i would say that uh, we are seeing as as vendors as, as in the technological space uh, uh, they can play a major factor uh, I'm maybe more skeptical when it comes to being applied uh, locally. I would say that the local expertise with uh, of the people with the feet on the ground uh, and that 
are experiencing the place where they are, uh, that it will play still a major role in the near future more than AI, at least in, in my perception in, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the close future. Because at the end of the day, what they know, being there, being on the ground, knowing their place, knowing their condition where they work, uh, knowing how they work, uh, it's, it's very difficult to model and to record in every kind of artificial intelligence. They have the human intelligence, maybe they can put it at work instead of some kind of computer. That's my understanding of it. Thank you. And Dr. Hammer, did you have some comments on this subject with respect to tailing stamps? Yes, I just wanted to ask the panel. This is the huge elephant in the room. We've had some very unfortunate incidents over the last few years. Do you think with the level of technology we have today, could we have averted some of these disasters? You know, Fundao, Brumadinho, names like that. Do you think with the technology we have, ESR and extensometers and all the different things we have, could we have possibly uh, predicted some of those failures and prevented them from happening? That's my question. We can start with the inside guy, since he looks at everything from the top. <laughs> what a pleasure to answer these difficult <laughs> questions first. Um, I mean, you mentioned the word uh, prediction. Um, it happened. Uh, I mean, I would say in most of the, uh, the recent event of collapse, uh, we had been contacted after the event to understand if it was possible to say something beforehand. In some cases, it was possible to see a progressive displacement. So basically, uh, yes, uh, there would have been uh, uh, some cases where uh, applying uh, an infinite, uh, say, strategy of monitoring with all the potential tools, uh, you could have seen some warning. Then I don't know what could you, you could have done in terms of maybe mitigating uh, or stopping it to happen. Uh, uh, this is outside of my expertise, but in a few cases, um, using more monitoring than what was in place uh, could have helped in uh, understanding that something was going on and was potentially evolving uh, into, into um, a collapse. Uh, is it possible all the times? Uh, in Brumadinho, we learned that uh, even if uh, you've got all the potential technology in place, there was zero precursor of that. Uh, so um, yes, there are events uh, that are uh, in the range of the, the predictability of the methods and the technologies that we have now, uh, but we cannot cover all the, uh, all the, all the events that are happening uh, uh, worldwide. I, I, you imagine in, 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 in the INSAR space, uh, it all started to see the deformation of the earthquake. So the question that we always get is, okay, now if you can see the effect of the earthquake, you can predict an earthquake. No, it's not possible. So uh, there are events uh, that are not predictable by definition. Um, and uh, I believe it will be the case for uh, uh, many years in the future. So I, I know it's not a positive, <laughs> a positive uh, contribution to this, but uh, I would say some of the events uh, are, were visible beforehand, some other were not. Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, from my side, uh, I think we need to remark that it's not the monitoring devices that are defining the dynamic of the event. But it's the, it's the dynamic of the event that uh, defines uh, which monitoring tools you need to use. And that's uh, uh, very important because, uh, for example, uh, in the case of the tailing dams, we know there could be several types of collapses, as David said. And in case of a collapse uh, for, uh, uh, you know, like static liquefaction and uh, sudden collapse, uh, some tools are uh, outside of the capabilities of detection or even in terms of uh, time for uh, preventive reaction. 
There are some other uh, devices that uh, in this case can be used for a reactive type of uh, monitoring, which uh, implies like the immediate detection of the collapse. And uh, as a consequence, it can be used to take uh, uh, quick decisions on, uh, for example, evacuation of uh, uh, towns, villages, and, uh, and areas at risk. So even uh, you know when uh, some technologies uh, like cannot help in terms of the prediction, but they can help in terms of the uh, reaction. And then again, uh, uh, I guess the main question is uh, uh, what you know when you have these uh, different types of uh, potential uh, failure. Because uh, of course, uh, static liquefaction, but uh, as David has said. Uh, if you have a structural type, type of failure on a earth embankment, that's a type of movement that is uh, clearly and uh, can be easily picked up by, uh, for example, a satellite uh, interferometric radar or ground-based interferometric radar or so on. So in that case, uh, you can easily, uh, hopefully, easily uh, measure these uh, precursors of uh, of a rupture, because of movements of a rupture before it happens, uh, like uh, it's usually done in an open pit mine. And so in that case, uh, you can uh, react in advance. So uh, uh, I guess the main question is, uh, can you uh, exclude uh, uh, in advance one type of deformation rather than the other? It's not up to me to say, and, uh, uh, but uh, I guess, you know, uh, we need to understand uh, that uh, many types of uh, uh, dam failure can happen, and uh, for each type, you know, there are specific uh, monitoring devices that can uh, play a critical role. Thank you, Nicole. Neil, and then uh, I will ask Will, since he's Mr. Underground, he will go last. <laughs> I don't really want to add anything on the monitoring side. Um, or a holistic site. Um, after Samarco and Bremadino, the international community said we no longer accept these types of events. Um, so if we look back at other industries that have gone through the same, same sort of process, um, taking the airline industry, for example, lots of plane crashes in the 50s, 60s, and now we have almost zero um, on the large, you know, large airlines, international airlines, although right now we're not flying, but um, in the last sort of 10 years, we haven't had any major events. So I think this question will probably be best answered in, in 10 to 15 years time uh, when we reconvene at uh, another rock science conference. Thanks, Neil. Will? Okay, the, uh, thanks. This is a, a very interesting question, uh, Reginald, but I have a different take on it, I guess. Uh, I think that uh, these failures are, are now completely socially unacceptable. And that's what's going to drive things. And where the industry has to go is we have to develop the technology for uh, much higher capacity filters. And we have to dewater all of the tailings so that we dry stack them. We simply get rid of the tailings dam. And that will get rid of the problem. Thanks, Will. Alison, over to you. I'm, I'm happy with the answers. Thank you. No, thank you, Reginald. Um, I guess we focused a lot on mining um, uh, and monitoring from a mining perspective. We had a question from the audience um, directly for Davida. But in terms of INSA, um, your thoughts on the use of INSA for monitoring construction and infrastructure projects and do you consider at some point they will be self-sufficient or will we definitely always require some type of on-ground field monitoring as well? Uh, well again, the answer, it, it depends uh, in a sense that uh, it will depend uh, mainly on how frequently you want your data uh, updated. With satellite INSAR, you know, the capacity to update the displacement map uh, and the time series is limited by the acquisitions of the satellite. So even, I, I mean, it depends on, on, the, on, the, on the kind of monitoring you want to do. If you want uh, to have uh, acquisitions, so update of the time series uh, every five minutes or something like that, still uh, you will need to have instruments on the ground. 
Um, so again, it's the application that is driving uh, and the, the, the potential issue that you have on, on the site that is driving this kind of decision more than the technology itself. What we are doing in the insert space is to try to optimize what we do in terms of to be uh, reactive. Uh, so in, in time, so to deliver as soon as we have the new image uh, available to deliver uh, in, in, the, in, in, in a time that is compatible with the idea of monitoring. And uh, looking forward, we will ingest uh, this new constellation that, again, uh, if, if it, 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 uh, it goes as they, as they say, they can deliver a daily image um, all over the world. So uh, this is what, what I, I can say. Again, it's not more, it's not the technological answer, but it really depends on the, on the application, on how, what you want to measure, what is the, the problem that you want to, to, to keep an eye on. Thanks, David. Will, from your perspective um, and your instrumentation background, do you have any comments there for monitoring and the frequency of civil or infrastructure? Again, I guess that depends on the specific infrastructure you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about a high dam, uh, then that is uh, probably requires more uh, routine and, and perhaps closely spaced monitoring than something like a, uh, a subway tunnel, which once it's uh, once it's constructed, because civil infrastructure like that is is designed and built to much higher factors of safety than we do in mining necessarily. And so normally you would not expect to see any movement. And so it, it would simply mean that you set you know, all the instrumentation programs now, quite simple to set them up that they, uh, they, they pull the instrument every few seconds but they only record the data if there is a change above a certain uh, threshold level. So it, you, you, you're, you're testing it continuously, but you're only, only recording if something moves. And then in terms of civil in infrastructure, if it was in a subway tunnel and I saw a couple of two or three millimeters of movement, I would probably be getting very concerned and wanting to know why that was happening because I shouldn't be seeing it. So it's a really a totally different kind of mindset that we have in the mining field. But it will depend again on what specific infrastructure you're talking about. Thanks, Will. I think in the interest of time, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm just gonna round out uh, what we've discussed today or in this last session and then hand over to the panel uh, for any closing comments. Um, I guess everyone's kind of commented in agreement that this modeling to monitoring or M2M process is a continuous process um, and can be used uh, to calibrate the failure mechanism or should be used to calibrate both the failure mechanism and material properties. Um, this information will be used uh, for the geotechnical engineer to have more awareness of the problem and the potential risk um, that this movement poses to the operation. Um, technical, technological advances will continue to assist um, this M2M process, but the data that's acquired must be fed back into the models and interpreted in a timely manner. Um, and everyone's agreed that every application is different. Um, it's it depends is a very common answer to many of these questions. So I just take that as that we'll never be able to remove the human factor from this process, that you'll always need an experienced geotechnical engineer. And I think, uh, you know, with um, different industries or service providers collaborating um, to assist uh, the end user can only be beneficial um, when we have to interpret uh, this data that we're getting from both our models and our monitoring instrumentation. So again, I'll probably go around in the order that we started. Um, Will, do you have any closing comments? Um, we're gonna try and finish at five o'clock on the dot. Sure. Uh, I don't have uh, much more to say than I've already said. Uh, I do believe that you're not going to get rid of the human interaction anytime soon. Uh, human beings have an incredible ability to interpret uh, 
fuzzy data and to understand risk and to understand uncertainty. And I don't know how you build all that into an AI system or something. Maybe that's possible. Uh, I, I know for sure in, in my remaining time, I'm not gonna see that, but perhaps it's possible someday. Are there many Hollywood movies where that AI goes terribly wrong when it gets control? Um, uh, Nicolo? Yeah, I guess my final comments, uh, basically on, on this topic, I totally agree. I mean, as I said before, uh, human factor is uh, absolutely fundamental. And, uh, you know, I think uh, one message that we, we try to, to drive every time is that uh, if you think that uh, you put a radar in front of the slope, you turn it on and you can just uh, forget about uh, what's happening there, it's, uh, it's the, the bigger risk and mistake that you can do. Because, uh, you know, this, uh, the, the technologies, they are uh, advancing a lot. And definitely the radar is a terrific instrument that can provide uh, uh, lots of information in a very, in a very quick time and with very high resolution and accuracy. But, uh, especially because of this, you know, the false confidence that is going to give you uh, answer by itself, it's a, it's a high risk factor that uh, we need to avoid. So from a technology provider, again, we, 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 we will strive to uh, provide uh, a better solution, more reliable. Uh, maybe as we said, uh, one day we also have the AI that can uh, help the, the user interpret uh, the radar data and uh, even, uh, let's say, uh, clear up some of the, of the doubts that uh, uh, could arise, but uh, they, somehow they will not replace the, the human brain. Thank you. David, closing comment or prediction yeah. of the future? Oh, prediction of the future. The, the only prediction I can give you is that I'm going to bed in a few minutes, but apart from that, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm in Italy now. So um, uh, yeah, I, I would say that I agree with, uh, with everything that was said. Uh, and uh, again, the centrality of the uh, uh, human here is, is important. We learned uh, as INSA community a lot from geotechnical engineers. Uh, and I believe that uh, the cooperation of these, uh, uh, of, of all the competencies of, 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 of all the actors in, uh, in, in here are so important to let it grow in terms of, uh, you know, the capability of everybody to, to, to learn and, and help each other. Um, I won't see, as, as I say, the, uh, um, a relevant use of artificial intelligence in the future simply because there are so many conditions that are very well known by the humans in their fuzzy logic uh, uh, approach, but uh, it's so easy maybe to deal with the issues uh, uh, as, as, as humans around the table, uh, much more than uh, speaking about details of the technology and losing yourself into, into useless discussions. So, um, I would uh, I would I would try to put uh, back the attention on uh, the competencies of the humans uh, more than on the technology themselves. Thank you, and Neil, a one minute closing comment from you. I certainly don't uh, disagree with the others on the human factor. I think it's here to stay. Um, I certainly think we should continue to improve all aspects of our geotechnical engineering projects from when they're conceptualized or studied and certainly when they're being executed. And that includes continuously improving our understanding of ground conditions and also using monitoring tools as a resource. Um, and for practitioners, be it consultants or, or mine operators, geotechnical engineers, particularly in mine operations, don't be afraid to tell your managers and your executives teams that you don't know something and you need to find out. Make the effort to explain uncertainty to them and explain some of the possible, cons possible consequences um, if you've got it wrong and the possible upsides if there's an upside. There could be an economical benefit to a better understanding as well. So, thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of Rock Science, thank you to all the panelists for joining this session. Uh, invite the audience to read through the panelists' position papers again uh, that will be available in the proceedings. And thank you to the audience uh, for your questions. 
Um, and Reginald, did you just want to introduce tomorrow's panel session as well, just to close out? And everyone, thank you again. It's sunrise here for me. It's night time for Davida. So I appreciate you guys joining wherever you are globally. Thanks, Reginald. Thank you so much. And Alison, you did an exceptionally good job with the panel. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. You will join us on ours as well. Um, will, Nicolo, Neil, Davide, thank you so much. We've learned a lot from this session. And tomorrow we're going to focus more on the modeling aspects of things. You have laid a solid foundation for what we'll be discussing tomorrow. But tomorrow we'll look at the different modeling tools, modeling philosophies, approaches. How do we use modeling so that we benefit from it rather than inhibit our understanding and learning? Surprise, surprise, we can actually inhibit understanding through modeling. And tomorrow we'll learn about this and about how we can actually use the tools well so that we gain insights. So I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow and thank you so much. Wherever you are, thank you for participating with us today. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.